power. It was not at all unusual to decorate mausoleums with furniture or jewelry. In other words, mausoleums were essentially treasure troves for thieves. Therefore, these places were typically fortified with lethal traps and the like to ward off intruders. Therefore, such a magnificent mausoleum must surely be laced with even more dangerous traps after checking the steps, the thief began inspecting the door, and then suddenly, the sounds around them returned to normal. The duration of the silence had expired, perhaps just in time. The thief quietly crept towards the door and began checking again. In the end, he rested something like a cup against the door and tried listening to what was beyond it. After several seconds, the thief turned to Gringam and company and shook his head. In other words, there's nothing. The thief himself was quite surprised and tilted his neck several times. The door was not even locked, which defied understanding, but since the thief had not found anything, it would be the frontliner's turn after this. Gringam stepped up and reached out to push the door which the thief had already oiled. The warrior behind him braced his shield as well. With a forceful shove, the heavy door began moving. Perhaps it was the oil, or because the people in charge of this place had been very meticulous in their work, but the door slid open smoothly despite its massive weight. The warrior standing by moved between the freshly opened door and Gringam, bracing his shield forward, so Gringam would not be hit by an attack or trap. No arrows or the like flew at him. The metal door was now completely open, and a vacuous darkness appeared before the members of Heavy Masher. Continual light, dot. The staff which the arcane magic caster was holding glowed with magical light. Through its variable, controllable illumination, they had a clear view of the mausoleum's interior. The magic caster incanted another spell, and the warrior's weapon glowed as well. The twin sources of light illuminated what looked like a chamber belonging to a member of royalty. In the middle of the room was what looked like a religious altar, upon which was placed a white stone sarcophagus. Said sarcophagus was over 2.5 meters long, and it was inscribed with delicate patterns. In the four corners of the room were white statues of warriors in armor and carrying swords and shields. And also H.M., does anyone know anything about that emblem? No, I've never seen anything like that before. A flag hung from the wall. It had a strange crest stitched on it in thread of gold. The thief and the magic caster knew most of the heraldry used by the surrounding nations, so if they did not recall this particular crest, then it probably did not belong to the kingdom's royalty. Could it be an emblem from nobles before the kingdom was founded? Thou means this is a relic from over two centuries ago. Many countries had been destroyed by the demon gods 200 years ago, and so there were surprisingly few nations around here whose history lasted beyond 200 years. The kingdom, the holy kingdom, the council alliance, and the empire had all been founded within the past 200 years. If that's really the case, then what exactly is this flag made of, to remain in the same beautiful shape despite its age? Maybe someone used preservation magic on it, or someone used magic to repair the aged portions. That's right. Say, leader, you don't need to talk in that weird way anymore. We're the only ones here now. Umu, Gringham's eyebrows bent to a dangerous angle, and then his face promptly broke into a smile. Ah, what a pain, thou this and means that, it's all so stupid. Thanks for your hard work. Still, he's right, when it's just us, you can speak normally. No, I can't. Speaking stiffly and formally like that makes me sound more like a great worker. And besides, changing the way I speak here, and there is a pain in the ass, so I always speak like that on the job. That's one of my principles, you know that, right? Gringam answered his companion's bitter smiles with a wry grin of his own. Gringam had originally been the third son of a farmer in the kingdom. If farmers evenly divided their fields between each and every one of his child over the generations, then the fields would shrink, which in turn would cause the crop yield to dwindle until the family line ended. Therefore, as the saying went, dividing the fields became synonymous with foolishness. Because of that, the fields of a farming family typically went to the eldest son, while the second son could choose to help with the housework and the fields, but the third son would be nothing but a waste of space. 
Therefore they typically chose to leave their homes and eke out a living in the city. It was true that Gringam was blessed with exceptional physical abilities and friends, with which he had made a name for himself. However, he had originally been a farmer, and he was a second-rate piece of insurance to ensure the family line continued at that, so he had no education. He could neither read nor write, and he did not understand etiquette. It was true that workers needed the strength to complete their jobs, and not education. However, there would be problems if he, as their leader, was ignorant. He did his best to study, but his mind was not as capable as his body, and he messed everything up. Even so, the reason why he had not been removed from his position as leader was because his comrades approved of his performance, academic abilities aside. In order not to disgrace these friends of his, Gringam had chosen to speak in a weird way. This would let their clients feel, he's advertising for his team, so there's nothing strange about him talking in a funny way. The fact was that people laughed at him for speaking in that way. However, it was far better than letting others say, a team led by a clueless farm boy won't amount to much. Very well, we have tarried sufficiently. Let us be off, gentlemen. Nobody objected to Gringham's declaration, and so they continued onward. At their head was the thief, who carefully entered the mausoleum and searched the interior. The other team members wedged stout iron bars into the gaps of the door. That way, no matter what kind of traps they sprang, the door would not close completely. After that, they half-closed the doors to prevent light from escaping the interior. While the thief carefully inspected the inside of the mausoleum, Grin Gam, and the others kept a close eye on their surroundings, taking pains not to slack off. While it was necessary, they had still made light. Someone might have spotted it. As Gringam hunkered down to watch the surroundings outside, the thief had already reached the bottom of the flag. After carefully examining the flag, he made up his mind to touch it, and in the instant he did, he immediately shrank away from it. It's okay for now, so come in everyone. The thief looked back, and after seeing that Gringam and company had entered the mausoleum, he pointed to the flag. This ought to be worth a pretty penny. It's been woven from threads of precious metal. Wahat? Threads of precious metal? Are they mad to hang such a thing here? Everyone exclaimed in surprise. Then, they rushed to the base of the flag and took turns to feel it up. The cold sensation was undoubtedly that of metal. From the way it gleamed, the thief was probably correct. A flag of that size ought to be very heavy, and after factoring its artistic worth, it must be worth a fortune. It would seem our client's bet paid off. While he has not yet made back the payment to us, no, to our four teams, there must surely be much treasure in a place like this. Are we going to take it with us? Gringam replied to the thief, tea would be too bulky and most weighty. We shall collect it later. Does anyone disagree? Nope, carrying this around really would weigh us down. Also, I've searched this place, there's no traps here, or secret doors. Then, I shall leave it to thee. Gringam nodded to the arcane magic caster. The wizard, and his colleague cast a spell in response. Detect magic, I can't sense any magical mechanisms around, unless they're hidden by concealing spells. Then there is nothing else to inspect. Let us continue with our prime directive. Everyone's eyes went to the sarcophagus in the center of the room. The thief spent a long time inspecting it, and judged that there were no traps. Gringam and the warrior nodded to each other, and then they pushed open the lid of the sarcophagus. The lid was massive, and they thought that it would be equally heavy, but it was much lighter than they expected. The two of them put their backs into pushing it and nearly lost their balance. After pushing open the sarcophagus lid, the contents reflected the light and emitted a blinding, sparkling radiance. There were ornaments and jewelry of gold and silver and various gemstones. There were over a hundred gold coins within the sarcophagus at a glance. While he had expected something like this, when they saw the flag, Gringam could not help but break into a smile as he saw all this. The thief carefully examined the interior, then reached into the sarcophagus and took out a piece of gleaming treasure, a gold necklace. It was a breathtakingly beautiful marvel of craftsmanship.
At a glance, the gold necklace looked like an ordinary necklace, but the chains were each carved with exquisite inscriptions. It's worth at least a hundred gold coins. You'd be able to get 150 for it no problem, no matter where you sold it. Everyone reacted differently when they heard the results of the thief's appraisal. Some of them whistled, some smiled so widely they could not close their mouths. What they all had in common was that their eyes were filled with the flames of delight and desire. We already arranged to get half of this, so at the very least, we've already made 50 coins. 10 per person. What a score. Looks like these ruins might end up being a treasure trove after all. Marvelous. This is just amazing. Exactly, but leaving all that treasure here is too much of a waste. We should make good use of it. As he said this, the wizard reached into the pile of treasure and took out a ring socketed with a massive ruby, which he kissed. It's huge. The priest reached into the sarcophagus and pulled back a fistful of gold coins, which he slowly let slip between his fingers. The coins clinked against each other with a clear, crisp sound. I've never seen gold coins like these before. Which era and which country did they come from? The thief nicked one of the coins with a knife and said in a voice filled with emotion, These gold coins are really high quality. They're twice the weight of the standard trading coin, and you could probably get even more just from their artistic value alone. This really is ku kukuku. The group could not control themselves and broke into quiet laughter. Just their share of this treasure alone would be a startling sum. You lot, thank the gods for your good fortune later. Let us take this treasure with us and discover the true trove. If we tarry, we shall not have a share of it. All right. Gringham's words were met with boisterous approval. Their voices were filled with excitement and passion. Part 4 They were at the central mausoleum. It was surrounded by statues of gigantic warriors and knights which looked like they were protecting their liege lord. They were so realistic that they looked like they might move at any moment. Hecarin was hidden by the foot of one of the warrior statues, keeping a close eye on one of the four smaller mausoleums. After some time, Hecarin noticed five people running over at top speed from one of the mausoleums. He continued hiding, inspecting the running people for any abnormalities and also whether anyone was observing them. After that, once he had confirmed that the running people were fine, Hecarin finally breathed a quiet sigh of relief. He leaned out from behind the statue and flashed a signal. Gringam, who was running at the head of his group, noticed it and ran toward Hecarin. Gringam, what took you so long? My sincerest apologies, it seems I have kept thee waiting. Well, it's not like we arranged a meeting time, so it's fine. That aside, let's move to a different place and decide what we'll do next. Hecarin lowered his stance, leading the way even as he kept an eye on his surroundings. Shortly after they began moving, Gringam asked, a question, if I might, has thy team discovered treasure? After hearing the barely concealed excitement in Gringham's voice, Hecarin recalled the way his own team had been and smiled to him in satisfaction. Oh yes, we did. We were all smiles. The old man said so too. So that was thy experience as well? Truly, we did well by coming to this tomb. Indeed, we should properly thank whichever big shot was buried here. M.M. That said, after discovering so much treasure, we might have to prepare ourselves for the possibility that the main tomb will be barren. No, I'm willing to bet that there'll be more treasure. Thy words, how much dare you wager? Not bad. Not only can I find more in the tomb, but I can make a tidy sum off you as well, wonderful. However, the problem is that you and I might bet on the same thing. Neither of them laughed out loud, simply smiled broadly. Indubitably. Speaking of which, this one has a question to ask of thee. What is that? Before Gringham's eyes was a massive statue, which had something which looked like a lonely stone plaque by its feet. You mean that? Hecarin told the results of their investigations as they continued walking. The other three teams had seen the characters on the slab, but nobody understood it. He had the faint hope that Gringam might be able to make sense of it. It seems to be a stone plaque with symbols that look like language inscribed on it. 
Thou sayest the word like in a vague sense. Nobody understands that language. It's not from the kingdom or the empire's language, and neither does it seem to be any of the old languages from around here. It might not even be a human language. However, we did understand the number 2.0. A number? Logically speaking, that ought to be the date when the mausoleum was built. But in that case, it would be far too small a number. Archie said it might be a riddle linked to these ruins. Ah, in any case, just keep it in mind. Indeed, I shall certainly do so. After passing the huge statue, they ascended a long, gently sloping flight of stairs that seemed to be made of the same material as the stone sarcophagus and the entrance to the central mausoleum stretched before them. Tis the stench of the dead. Yes, you're right. It's a common smell on the Katza Plains. Hecarin expressed his agreement with Gringham's muttering. While it was not as nauseating as the vile odor of decay, the faint stench of undeath unique to graveyards hung in the cold air. There were undead present in such a well-kept tomb the group prepared themselves as they stepped into the mausoleum. Before them was a great hall. Countless mortuary slabs of stone lined either side of the hall, and opposite them was a staircase leading down. The door leading downstairs was wide open. A strangely chilling gust of ice-cold air flowed out from behind it. This way. Led by Hecarin, Gringham's group descended the stairs. A burial vault lay at the foot of the stairs, with a set of doors straight ahead. It seemed to be the only one around. While it was more cramped than the room above, the mausoleum, it was wide enough. Hecarin's companions in foresight, Arias Tenbo and Palpatra's group were all here. Now then, what shall we do next? The original plan was to split up here and investigate the interior, but after inspecting the mausoleums, do you have any other ideas? After saying so, Hecarin looked around at everyone else. It did not feel like anyone wanted to propose anything new. Was it desire, or just a simple trick of the light? He could not be sure what that glow in everyone's eyes was. Their faces were filled with excitement as they longed to rush into the depths of the tomb. In that case, I have a suggestion. We'll sweep the outside in a circle to check for hidden doors. The team leader might have spoken, but the team members did not look happy at it. After all, they had all seen the glittering prizes just now. Even if that opinion came from their veteran leader, it was very hard for them to go along with it. Surely, they must have imagined the treasure fleeing before their very eyes. How about it? We've checked the surface, but we can't say we checked it very thoroughly. There might be other roots hidden beneath the mausoleums, don't you think? Besides, we haven't checked the graveyard, have we? I believe what the revered elder is trying to say is that according to the songs of the bards about the great ruins, that is to say, the ruins of Sasashal there was a safe passage near the entrance which could take everyone straight to the heart of the area. Ah, Gringam. We've checked already, but unfortunately there aren't any secret doors in this room. Precisely. We're willing to take one for the team, so in exchange, we hope you'll give us a share of the treasures you find on this level. How about 10% from each other team? Also, if you find another level below, can we ask for the right to go in and look first? I have no objections to that proposal. The first to reply was Gringam. Shortly after that, Hecarin also expressed his agreement. All right, it seems nobody objects. By the way, how about you, Uzrith? Personally, I object very much, but it's only 10%, hardly a big deal. The old man laughed merrily at Aria's barbed reply. It was Aria who was displeased by having his acidic words completely disregarded. Ah, uh, old sir. In that case, we have a request for you. We found a huge flag woven of precious metal threads in the mausoleum we investigated. We didn't bring it along because it was too bulky. Can we trouble you to help us bring it back? I concur with Hecron's opinion. Though it shames me to trouble thee, I would be glad if thou couldst help us recover ours as well. Since it's that way, we'll leave ours to you as well. Aruya jerked his chin at one of the elves, and the skinny girl shakily unloaded a large piece of cloth she was carrying on her back and laid it on the ground understood. Is there anything else you wish to leave behind, 
or which you want us to take away? Nobody answered Palpatra's question. All right. Then, we'll follow the suggestion just now and investigate the surface. You lot need to be careful too. However, if you find any valuables, feel free to leave them for us. Ha ha, revered elder. Gladly will we leave the monsters to thee, but regretfully, we will not leave so much as a single coin of treasure behind. The group chuckled, and then Hecarin asked everyone, then, shall we move out? The group accepted that suggestion immediately, and so they went forth. Their eyes gleamed with desire and expectation as they took their first step into the unknown ruins, the underground tomb. After opening the door in the room, a passage led straight into the depths. Perhaps they should have expected this, but the passage was very clean. This was a passage of stone with no mildew or algae growing on it. There were alcoves on either side, each filled with human-sized objects wrapped in funerary shrouds. There was none of the stench that was unique to corpses. There was just the cold, clear air, as well as a smell like that of the dead. There were white lights spaced along the ceiling at regular intervals, but due to the great distance between them, there were still a lot of shadowy corners along the passage. While it did not affect their travels, the dimly lit lamplight made them wonder if they had missed something. Moving without preparing illumination seemed quite dangerous. Rober, is there an undead reaction from that body? No, none at all. Really? Archie replied, and then walked over to a wrapped corpse, slicing the shroud open with a dagger. After seeing her actions, two of the men from the group stepped forward to help expose the cadaver underneath the shrouds. Judging by the height and physique, it's most likely human. And a grown male. He's not wearing clothes, so we can't tell which era the ruins came from. Still, these ruins really are a mystery. We can't tell its age from its architecture, or the burial styles. For all we know, these ruins might be from over 600 years ago. If that were really the case, then this would be a historic find. Perhaps that topic might have been interesting to an academic, but they were here to work. As Hecarin and Gringam stared icily at them, the three quickly added, these ruins' date of construction and background are still a mystery, after all. Understood. Can we move on now? I want to kill monsters. The somewhat displeased area expressed his agreement with Hecarin and Gringam, and the group continued forward again. However, they stopped again after taking a few steps. Everyone drew their weapons, stealing themselves for combat. The sound of bones rattling came from ahead of them. They could see undead creatures running at them from ahead under the illumination of the ceiling lights. As the distance between them shrank, and they saw what they were up against, a commotion rose from the shocked workers, as though they had seen something they did not dare believe. Oh come on, are you kidding me? Oi oi seriously, eh? Are those really skeletons? The moment someone mentioned the names of those monsters, their laughter exploded forth uncontrollably to fill the entire passageway. Oi 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 oi. No matter how you look at it, skeletons just won't be enough, right? There's all of us over here. Skeleton-type monsters did not vary too much in appearance, and sometimes, one might not be able to tell them apart at a glance. However, judging by the impression they gave, the workers were certain that these were just ordinary skeletons. If this is supposed to be a recon in force, then they ought to be sending stronger monsters, I've got it. Either nobody's in charge of these ruins, or the opposition can't gauge our strength, or they're stupid enough that they haven't discovered the intruders yet. Everyone's laughter continued. No skeletons are just too far-fetched. For all we know, the treasures of these ruins are only in the mausoleums above. That would be terrible. Skeletons were far too weak in comparison to these workers, who were comparable to mithril-ranked adventurers. In addition, they were fewer in number than the workers, so they had no idea what the opposition was thinking. Faced with the six skeletons blocking their path, everyone looked at each other, not knowing who should go first. Count me out. Aria clearly stated his opinion, and everyone could understand how he felt. Then I shall go. After that, Gringam strode forward. There was no telling what was going through the skeletons' empty heads. 
Did they think the lone warrior had been cast out of his group? Or something else? The skeletons attacked at once, and then, his cleaving axe and shield easily smashed them to bits. It had only taken the space of a few seconds. No, in fact it had been even less than that. After shattering the six skeletons and treading their remains underfoot, Gringam sighed tiredly. It wasn't too because he had been fatigued by battle, but because he was very disappointed by the fact that after coming to these unexplored ruins which were a worker's dream, the very first battle which was supposed to add color and flavor to this adventure had turned out to be against skeletons, the lowest ranking of the undead. He found it quite sad. Pathetic, skeletons are just skeletons, after all. That said, don't get careless. Consider that more powerful undead might show up, and advance while staying alert. Everyone's lips drew tight as they heard Gringham's words. They advanced, deeper into the ruins, their hearts filled with expectation for the mountain of treasure that awaited them. Good grief, they're gone. They're all gone. They might be workers, but we did break bread with them, and they're our comrades for this job. I hope they'll come back safely. What do you think, Mom and San? That they're all going to die? Ains answered in gloomy tones, and the leader of the adventurers who had questioned him froze up. Crap. I said what was in my heart. E.R. No, what I meant was that we should be mentally prepared for that outcome. These are previously undiscovered, and there's no telling what dangers are waiting for them inside. Being too optimistic is harmful. I see, so that's what you meant, thanks for your concern. I thought I was being pretty stiff, did that actually pass muster? I feel pretty good about this. The leader was probably nodding nonstop, because those words were spoken by an adamantite-ranked man, so he was blindly thinking the best of him. It would seem that Ain's efforts, he had been as friendly and approachable as possible during their journey to Nazareth, had borne fruit, given their favorable attitude towards him. Then, in keeping with the plan, I will go rest first. Ains headed for his, naturally, he shared it with Narbral tent. Since it was some distance away from the other tents, he knew some people had been spreading rumors that it was because he did not want certain sounds to be heard by others. In fact, the adventurer's leader had told him that just now. Compared to the workers, the leader seemed to want to become closer to Maman, who was a fellow adventurer, which was why he had told him what he had heard from the workers. Ains and Narbral entered the tent together and closed the flap, and then just in case, they checked around outside. Nobody seemed to be paying attention to them, in fact, they seemed to be deliberately trying not to stare at Ains. While people call this a love nest, I guess I was right to not deny it right away. That way, they won't be suspicious of why we pitched our tent so far away, and they won't pay undue attention to us or come near this place. He might have lost some things, but he had gained much more in return. Ains took off his helmet, exposing his skeletal face.